John Emerson with us, who is the turf grass nutrient management agent here at the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension. Um, we'd also like to thank the um, Sussex Conservation District for partnering with us on this today. Um, so John has a bachelor's degree in plant and soil science from the University of Kentucky and almost 20 years in the turf grass industry. John recently decided to shift gears and make the jump to University Extension. He's always relied on Extension agents in his career and thoroughly enjoyed these interactions, even envying those on the other end of the stick. So when presented with an opportunity to join UD Extension, he took the leap. John looks forward to sharing his experience and knowledge with the people of Delaware and helping in any capacity. So John joined us and his first day was March 16th. <coughs> that was our very first day that we started working from home. So John has had quite the experience starting out his career here at UD Extension, but we think, we, we think we've got a good one in him. So hopefully you guys learn a lot from him. And uh, John, please take it away. Yeah, thanks, Blake. Uh, it's been interesting to say the least, but uh, it's been fun as well. And uh, We've all learned a lot during this, this uh, pandemic, but uh, the, the good thing is that the adaptations of people has, has shown through pretty pretty pronounced. So um, that's something to something to be proud of there. Um, so today, this talk is about turf grass management, best management practices. Um, some of the things that we'll cover today, we'll go over the four, four R's of uh, fertilizer. Uh, we'll talk about soil amendments and, and how we can use those in the, in the urban landscape. Uh, water management, and best management practices for that. And then at the end, I've, I've got a few slides to talk about the, the fall armyworms and some integrated pest management solutions uh, for those, because I know uh, it's been a, a major issue here in this region. Um, so if there's one thing to, to take some solace in is that uh, it, this, this uh, outbreak of fall armyworms is not isolated to Delaware. This was a, a region-wide issue. So uh, anyways, I'll just kind of just go on into it. But one thing I wanted to kind of share with you guys is kind of my uh, de facto definition of, of what I think turf grass management is. I, this is not an official definition. This is just something I kind of came up with and how I look at managing grass. Um, I see it as the utilization of grasses while implementing the necessary management practices to control the growth in order to achieve a desired surface. And that surface is, is it going to be a regularly mowed and manicured urban lawn? Is it going to be a putting green? Is it going to be a fairway? Is it going to be a soccer field? Um, managing the growth along with the, the necessary management practices is going to determine what kind of surface you have. And so you have to ask yourself, where do you stand on that spectrum? Are you a golf course putting green or are you uh, far on the other end where you don't mow? Um, it just, it depends on what you want. Um, and, but the more, um, the more inputs are needed, the more manicured the, the, the turf needs to be. So um, with that said, just kind of jump right in. I, I think we need to rethink how we view fertilization. Um, the soil, if we get our soils right from establishment, the vast majority of our nutrients can come from our soils. But in an urban setting, that, that can be a challenge with construction and mixing and, and cutting and filling and compaction. All of those things um, uh, are more prevalent in, in the urban landscape. But uh, when we talk about fertilizers, all we're doing is adding whatever the soil doesn't supply. And so our primary nutrients, which are of course, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then everyone a lot of times forgets about oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. But those three um, are from the atmosphere and from the soil. And so, uh, but, but also the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium can come from the soil if it's a healthy soil. So um, if we get our soils right, we can cut down our fertilization, um, our overall use, uh, and have a more efficient system with, with as far as nutrient cycling goes. Um, and then 
the idea is, is to avoid deficiencies with, with fertilizers. And, and how do we do that? We do that with soil testing. Soil testing is a, um, it's a nutrient index. So if you hear, I've, I've heard this a lot of times that, well, you have X amount of this nutrient, but it's unavailable. Well, if you did a soil test, especially using a reputable lab like University of Delaware, uh, they use the Malik 3 extraction method. So this is exactly what they're telling you. So when you do a soil test, this is telling you what is in the soil solution and what is available. So unavailability is, is not a thing. If the soil test says you have sufficient, let's say phosphorus, for example, they're, they're, then that's what you have there available to the plant. So um, I don't believe... Um, uh, a lot of times unavailability is used in the wrong context. So um, if you soil test, you, you alleviate and you kind of skip that, that, that issue altogether. So here's kind of the, the, the nutrients in and out. This is the, the plant available nutrient pool and how they cycle in and out. Um, so of course we have our fertilization. Um, atmospheric deposition, which is, it can be from combustible engines, and this is specific to the urban landscape, combustible engines, lightning, um, those things can happen from atmospheric deposition and then de deposition of organic residues. So that's the, um, the decomposition of, of, of leaves, plant parts, roots, stems, all of those things go into the organic deposition pool. And so that is our in, our input. And then on the outs, on coming out of that, how we lose our nutrients is through clipping removal, uh, gaseous loss, conversion to unavailable forms and leaching. And again, if we have a really healthy soil with um, uh, some quality amounts of organic matter and, and that can be facilitated by clipping removal or other organic composts and things of that nature in time. Um, the organic matter, increases over time and clipping removal is, is one thing that can, can help you there. But one thing to think about is when we talk about time is the faster the grass or, or your plants or, or you know your trees, the faster they grow, the faster the organic deposition occurs. So that, I'm not saying to go out there and, and fertilize your, your landscape just to get organic matter deposition, uh, to increase, but that, that's typically the, the trend how that works. Um, and so again, organic matter is really a critical piece of this and, and trying to accumulate as much of that as possible. Can, it, it can really help with, with all of those things, especially uh, nutrient losses and specifically nitrate leaching. And so let's talk about cl clipping management. If, if there's one thing I can uh, get you guys to, to take home with you and, and believe in heavily is, is, is clipping should always be returned. I, the, the judge, jury, they, they've all decided that uh, uh, collecting clippings is, is not a best management practice. And for the life of me, I'm not sure why we still do this, but it, I do see it on occasions. But I do everything in my power to try to convince people that they're, this is a, a, a core practice and um, you're, you're, you're not doing yourself any favors or, or the quality of your turf also. Because clippings are fertilizer, right? So you, the fertilizer that's in the soil gets taken up, or the, excuse me, the nutrients that are in the soil gets taken up by the roots and then translocated throughout the plant to the, to the uh, leaves. And then we remove those leaves that contain the same fertilizer that we just put down on the ground. So um, recycling your clippings puts those added nutrients or uptake of nutrients back into the soil. And, and something to think about here is 30% plus, and in some situations it can be 50% or more, uh, but on average 30% um, plus of our yearly nitrogen needs can be um, obtained through through clipping, recycling. Um, it's just, collecting clippings is a waste. It's a waste of, of time. Um, 
I think there maybe there's one caveat to that is if you collect your clippings and maybe you you put them in in your vegetable gardens or, or things of that nature. But as long as we're not just completely disposing of them, like dumping them in the ditch, or uh, we're trying to get those clippings back into the soil. And so, if you have a healthy soil or a healthy turf, um, carbon sequestration increases over time, and adding those organic materials helps um, with carbon sequestration as well. And when we talk about clipping management, the one of the main things we need to think about is, is keeping them off impervious surfaces. Because again, like I said earlier, there's those are nutrients in there. Um, leaving, in my mind, leaving clippings on impervious surfaces is no different than dumping fertilizer on the ground or on that same impervious surface. It's the exact same thing. Um, albeit that it's much smaller um, concentrations, but if you have um, a million people or a million homeowners doing that, then you can see how that could get out of control really quickly. So the take home message is recycle your, or excuse me, do not um, harvest your clippings, keep them on the lawn or in the landscape. John, can I add something real quick to this? Yeah, go ahead, Blake. Um, for, for the same thing as, as impervious surfaces, if you do have a, you know, a stormwater structure or something like that, making sure you're not blowing the clippings into the water uh, is another thing. That's, again, as John said, they're nutrients, they'll end up uh, feeding algae growth and, and things like that. So trying to aim it away from your, your water structures as well would be good. Good point, Blake. Thank you. And so this little don't do this picture is, is pretty, pretty indicative of uh, is a good example of what Blake was saying. Um, you, all of these things on this picture are things you don't want to be doing, right? So you can see the the guy here in the bottom left. He's he's um, throwing fertilizer all over the place into the driveway, into the street, and while his wife or his his mom, whoever that may be, she's watering the lawn until the point of runoff and. They also got the sprinkler going in the background. And then whatever the, the, the guy in the blue shirt is doing, um, that fertilizer that, that he's applying is gonna be swept off by the runoff of the water um, and then taken straight directly into the drain. Um, and so we, we need to be real cognizant of that. And if we kind of shift our eyes to the bottom right of the screen, um, the the gentleman is is blowing his grass clippings right into the street and then you can obviously see how the uh the storm water and irrigation water runoff is going to take those grass clippings which are nutrients directly into the to the storm water drain and then now that we're getting into the time of year when the leaves are starting to fall um uh, you know i saw this and i don't know if this is um uh, indicative of all the counties or cities around the state, but I've, I've seen this not just here in Delaware, but back home in Louisville and some um, municipalities, they do this where uh, everybody can sweep their leaves to the street and then someone comes and picks them up. Um, well, I think the, um, I think the theory behind it is good. It's a social service for, for the community, but at the same time, these people put these leaves out on the street way ahead, maybe two, three weeks ahead of when the pickup date is. And then you have leaves that are blocking stormwater drains. Plus there's nutrients in leaves as well. So it's no different than a grass plant. The trees do the, do the exact same thing. They take up the nutrients through the soil and translocate it throughout the plant into the leaves. And so those leaves have fer uh, fertilizer in them as well. So mulching your leaves is a best management practice. And I will put a caveat to that, saying that I understand someone that has a heavily, heavily treed um, um, yard or, or landscape. Uh, even if you do run a mower over top of them, um, they may not be mulched sufficiently. So um, another thing to think about is if you could rake up those leaves and recycle them and reuse them somewhere, if you have an abundant amount. Um, but I, I just 
think that we could do a better job with our, our nutrient cycle. Okay, so the, the four R's of fertilization. Um, these thing, the, this, this theory takes into account the environment, social pressures and economic issues as well, right? So the four R's are the right place, right rate, right source and right time. And so the whole idea behind this is is trying to avoid the wastefulness um, because wastefulness gets us back into the to the old story of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus into our waterways and then we have eutrophication and then eutrophication uh, causes algae and then the, the the death of the algae causes depletion of oxygen so we get in this vicious cycle and so trying to to mitigate our impact is kind of the basis of, of the four R's of fertilization. Okay, so the, the first one is right place. Um, our, we only want to apply the fertilizer to the intended target, where we need uh, the fertilizer. So I can promise you one thing, that concrete does not need fertilizer and concrete will never have a nutrient deficiency. So anytime we have, um, uh, fertilizer on impervious surfaces, same with grass clippings. Um, uh, we want to make sure we get that removed. And typically, if it's dry out uh, and the, the pavement's dry, it sweeps up very easy or blows off the, the pavement very easily as well. And um, the right place. So fertilizing uh, water banks, um, water body, the banks of water bodies, that's, uh, that's not a best management practice. So I think what is it, 20 feet is, is uh, considered best or considered ideal, but more is better. So the farther you can keep your fertilizer away from those um, um, banks of, of water bodies is, is best. So right rate, um, putting out the right amount in the amount that the plant, that is needed by the plant. So. Um, the, the picture on the left, uh, it looks like about two or three of the four R's were, were missed there. Maybe that was right rate or wrong rate, wrong source, um, improperly calibrated spreader. Uh, maybe the conditions were very windy, blowing the, the fertilizer from side to side. Uh, I'm not sure, but that's a good indication if you have um, striping um, in your turf that something went awry there. Um, and a lot of times it has a lot to do with your, your calibration. Um, but you can obviously see the, the nitrogen deficiency on the, the yellowed uh, portions of the turf compared to where the fertilizer was actually applied efficiently with the darker stripes. And then kind of on the other end of that spectrum, if we apply too much, then we can have, we can kill grass and, and other plants as well. So on the right, we have um, some kind of spill or, or something, of, something of that nature, but um, we can see that too much fertilizer will kill our turf. And when we talk about applying the right rate, the rate is going to be determined by our soil test. And so I can't stress enough that soil testing is, uh, is critical and it's a, um, uh, best management practice for turf dust management. And a little plug, use the University of Delaware um, lab. And so again, when we apply too much or, or too little, we can get on, on uh, either ends of those spectrum. So if we apply too much, um, we can increase plant succulency. And succulency um, uh, is basically a sign of extreme uh, of a fast growth rate. And so if we do this at the wrong time of the year, um, then we can set ourselves up for um, various pest outbreaks, um, especially fungal diseases in the summer. Um, and, uh, but again, there's other times of the year where you do want to um, grow a little bit faster than, than what you might be comfortable with, like right now. Um, the fall is, is by far the, the, the best time to fertilize, but uh, anyways, I'm kind of getting off, the, off my point here, but 
the other end of the succulency is, is nutrient sufficiency. And so if we put on too little, then we can have a, a, a plant that can suffer those same consequences of succulency. So finding that sweet spot right in the middle um, is, is, is ideal. And the, again, those soil test results and, and recommendations can help you um, kind of find that sweet spot. And then when we talk about rate, we have to talk about our spreaders and our sprayers or however we're applying our, our fertilizer. So uh, always calibrate your spreader, especially when switching products, granular product, products especially. Um, the prill size of the fertilizer is not the same from, from product to product, from bag to bag. So you have to account for that um, when, when thinking about calibrating your, your granular spreaders. Um, but as far as the, the liquid sprayers go, um, those should be calibrated periodically, you know, check your equipment for leaks um, or any kind of malfunctions. Um, but I think maybe uh, uh, once a quarter uh, or a couple times a year will, will be sufficient. Um, or anytime you change parts or anything major, any kind of changing or uh, major maintenance um, to, to your hose-in sprayer, then we need to consider uh, calibrating. Okay, so right source, um, using the right source of fertilizer or, you know, using slow release fertilizers, which is categorized as 35% or greater, uh, slow release nitrogen or water insoluble nitrogen. Using those as much as possible is a, is a best management practice. And not all fertilizers are, are uh, uh, made equal. So using reputable companies, um, that's a, um, um, a, good, a good take home message there. And if we are using water soluble uh, nitrogen sources, um, and we opted out of the slow release. Uh, if we are using these water soluble granulars, we need to make sure that we are irrigating um, to um, get that into the soil solution. So as soon as we, we're done uh, fertilizing, uh, make sure we get a little, a little water on that to kind of get that uh, chemical process and break down better. Okay, so the right time. Um, obviously, um, fertilizing right before the monsoon on the right, that, that's a poor idea. Even um, if you use fast release, slow release, if you get enough rain, it's not going to matter. So we, we have to pay attention to the weather um, before uh, or in when we are trying to formulate our, our fertility plan. Um, so if if we fertilize right before a big rain, um, the chances of any of that holding on are very low. You know, I'm, I'm talking about downpours, but at the same time, um, being a weatherman is, is part of, of, of turf grass management. So, or a weather woman, if you will, excuse me. Um, so just pay attention to the weather. It, it's critical to understand these things and, um, um, to, in order to uh, do the right things. And then we need to understand the growing seasons of our, our, of our turf and, and which turf we have. Do we have warm season grasses or, or cool season grasses? But um, if we talk about cool season grasses, um, everybody says, oh, well, uh, the fall is the best time to, to fertilize our cool season grasses. And that answer is yes, but, um, November is too late. It's September, um, maybe even the last week in August um, through the end of October. Um, if, if you're fertilizing in, in November, uh, you're, you're, you're gonna be lucky to get a 25% of, uh, of, of that fertilizer into the plant. The rest is gonna be lost to the environment. So, uh, because the, the plants are starting to shut down and as those plants shut down, those metabolic processes shut down as well. And so if those metabolic processes are shut down, nutrient uptake is not happening. And so the loss potential increases as we get colder into the year. And, and I'll show you something, uh, I've got some more slides on that topic. I think
think after, after this one. Um, but the, the window for fall fertilizer for um, um, cool season grasses is September and October, and that's it. Um, I, I will say that there, there's one caveat to that. If you are establishing turf in November, which um, cool season grasses, it's possible. Um, you can do it, especially if you're, you're laying sod. Um, then that would be an exception. Um, but of course, you don't want, you want to try to avoid uh, November and December side um, installations. Okay, so let's talk about fall fertilization and, and nitrogen loss potential. So um, this was some work done by um, Carl Guillard, um, Doug Soldat, and a, and a few others. Um, I think Carl's with the University of Connecticut and Doug is with the University of Wisconsin. Um, and so you can see here, as we start to get in on the left-hand graph, as we start to get into um, October and November and December, we really see an increase um, in, in nitrate leaching. And so on the left hand of the graph is, is cumulative nitrate mass in the percolate. And so what they did is they collected the water um, percolated through um, a, a, speci a specific turf grass profile. And then they analyzed that water for the nit uh, nitrate content. And you can see as we move um, through the, and we get progressively colder, the amount of nitrogen captured from that percolate uh, significantly increase. And so here are the averages. So September, they collected about 15.5% um, in the percolate water. And in October, that jumped to 30%. And November, 33% and 41% for uh, December. So if we're fertilizing in, in November, there is potentials between 30% and 60% of loss. Um, so we need to be really cognizant of that when we go to fertilize our, our turf. So September and October, and you know, you could even argue that October might be too late. Um, if someone asked me for my opinion, it's September and that's it. Uh, so um, we're, we're getting to the point now, we're, we're still warm, but there's gonna come a point soon uh, where, um, we have that first frost, and then after that first frost, everything really starts to shut down after that. So our general growth cycles can, can tell us a little bit about our, our fertility uh, management schemes. So if we just look at the bottom there, the, the warm season um, uh, turfs, uh, or the C4 plants, we see our, our basically our, our growing season is from um, mid to late May, um, basically to the end of September. Um, and that's, that is when we want to um, start our fertilizer in mid to late May, and then we're done in August. And then mowing of our warm season grasses, end of September, you're done, because you want to leave um, the most uh, leaf material above ground the, the more leaf material above ground that you leave going into the winter, the more hardier that plant will be. And it'll have a better chance of survival and, and coming out the next spring uh, with, with, with less damage. And that goes for the warm season and the cool season grasses as well. And then the cool season grasses up top, we can see we have kind of a, a, a double hump here. We, we start to ramp up in the spring and then we dip in the summer and then we ramp back up in the, in the fall. And um, this is just a general growth cycle, but I'm gonna show you a couple of graphs um, in the next slide that, that kind of indicate that that fall period is a little more of a vigorous uh, period there for growth. So turf grass growth potential, this is strictly based on average daily temperatures. And average daily temperatures for our cool seasons are 65, or approximately 65 to 75. And then um, 82 plus uh, for our warm season grasses. And then um, as long as there are no limiting factors, um, warm season grasses can grow well above 110, 115 degrees. Um, so, but anyways, that's just kind of a, a side note there. but. In the top right, um, 
and then one thing before I, I get into that is that um, on the left hand side of the graphs here, we have percent growth potential and on the bottom we have um, month of the year. The blue line is cool season grasses and the red line are warm season grasses. And one thing to think about is anything over 50% growth potential is considered vigorous growth. Um, anything under that is where growth is, is, is surely inhibited. Um, and the top right we have, um, this is for, uh, it's either from Dover or Newark, but either way they're, they're almost exactly identical. So they, they wouldn't change. Um, but you can see here, our growth potential in the month of um, September and October, we're, we're almost at 100%, as opposed to um, the spring where we get up to about 90%. So fertilizing during that period um, is, is critical to, to accumulate mass uh, in our roots. Um, and then if you contrast that with our warm season grasses, we have basically, if we kind of look here at the, the 50%, let me get my, uh, my pointer going here. Okay, so right here we have about 50%. And if we look at our warm season grasses, it's basically from mid June to the end of August. And that's it. The rest of the time, um, turf grass growth for our warm season grasses is slow. Um, and just looking to kind of contrast these with different areas around the country, in the bottom, in this bottom right graph, we have Worcester, Massachusetts. And you can see the difference here that why there's no warm season grasses that far north. There's never a, a point in the growing season um, where um, you can facilitate quality uh, warm season growth but you also have a large window of quality cool season growth in Worcester, Massachusetts. And then if we look at Miami, Florida, it's a completely different scenario. They, the vast majority of the season is, is, is quality growth for our warm season grasses where we only have a sliver of time during the year where our cool season grasses um, um, will, will do well. Okay, so now we'll talk about organic amendments such as compost. Um, organic amendments can be, again, grass clippings. Those are organic amendments. Uh, compost, whether they're animal products or human products or plant products or a combination of all three. Um, manures, wood chips, biosolids, all of those are considered organic amendments, but they decompose over time uh, they're a plant nutrient source and they can uh, mitigate um, many poor quality soil issues that, that we experience uh, in, in Delaware, especially in the urban landscape. And the good thing about living in Delaware, but we have poor soils from urbanization, is that we have a plethora of options for, for compost. We have a lot of chickens here. We grow a lot of corn. Uh, we grow a lot of uh, soybeans. All of these byproducts um, can be combined with um, or all of these organic byproducts from either ant or plant, plant or animal sources can be combined to make really quality compost. So what, what does compost do for us? Um, well, it has many, many benefits. Um, it can increase our cation exchange capacity, which is the ability for our um, soils to hold on to nutrients. Um, it can increase our pH if we're dealing with a low pH soil. Um, it increases our carbon and nutrient and nitrogen cycling, um, soil aeration, soil drainage, faster plant establishment, soil structure, and it decreases bulk density, uh, which is also known as compaction. And so the use of, of heavy equipment during uh, many construction practices will lead to significant soil compaction. Um, even in, in, in Delaware, where we have really sandy soils, this can still occur and, and it's quite often occurs, uh, but the increased bulk density uh, make it difficult 
for, for plant roots to penetrate. Um, and so you're left with um, a, a soil that is not supportive of, of, of quality plant growth. And you know, here, here's a perfect example here. Um, so you're, this is a, a fairly new subdivision um, where this happened. And the, the tree here, or the soil underneath is, is, was graded and then backfilled with uh, God knows what, but it's very, very heavy clay soil. Um, and it's about one step away from pottery clay. So you can see just a little bit of rain and you're creating a bowl. So um, if you amended this soil prior to, to plant establishment, uh, you, you might be able to get that small amount of water to percolate through the soil a lot faster. Um, and so you don't have that, that water just pooling, pooling on the top. But some compaction, compaction symptoms we might see are, are turf quality decline, um, nutrient deficiencies, um, easy, easily drought stress plants, and then lateral root growth, ponding of water like we see here, and, and, and uh, quick batch accumulations. Um, sod failure is very common. Um, plant failure is very common. Um, plants that manage to survive and grow in compacted soils will have an increased water and fertilizer demand. Um, and they also be more susceptible to pests and diseases. So um, a lot of times, um, if, if you're going to apply a pound of nutrient or a pound, pound of uh, nitrogen to your turf and the soil underneath is heavily compacted, uh, you might not even see a, a response. And then you say, oh man, I just put down a pound of nitrogen. I'm gonna put down another pound more. And it might take two to two and a half pounds before you even see a response. And so obviously the plant cannot use all of that, two pounds of nitrogen um, at one time. So you end up losing a lot of that. So when we talk about compost, it, there, here's a general guide. Um, we're looking at a carbon to nitrogen ratio of, of, of approximately 30 to one or less. You start getting over um, 30 to one um, carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, the microorganisms are, can steal um, available nitrogen from the soil in order to break that, that compost down. So you might end up with nutrient deficiencies. Um, so keeping your, your compost under a 30 to 1 uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. And you're looking for about a 30 to 50 percent moisture content. Um, and if you have a really, a really wet compost, it makes it very difficult to spread. And if you have something that's too dry, uh, it can turn into dust and, and kind of be a nightmare to, to spread. And then we're looking at Organic matter, 30% or more, ash content, 70% or less, and then metals. Um, this typically isn't an issue um, with, with plant products or animal products. This typically comes into play when we talk about biosolids. And um, biosolids are an amazing, um, uh, amazing product. They're actually a little better than plant and animal compost, but there's, there can be metals involved in that process of, uh, of processing of biosolids. But the good thing is, is that they are locally and federally, federally mandated um, ranges where they might uh, be a problem. And so whoever's um, producing these biosolids has to maintain those standards in order to, to sell the products. And then soluble salts. Um, this can be a, a, a bigger product or a bigger problem with our animal uh, or human byproducts. But uh, one good thing about this is that once you, if you're incorporating them into the soil, um, you're, you stand to, to fare less and, and have a, the salts have a bigger impact on your plants. But if you're talking about top dressing uh, with, with compost and established turf, then um, a quarter of an inch is, is going to, to cause very little impact in, in, or impact for soluble salt damage. And then we're looking at um, a nitrogen percentage of about a half percent to 3%, and then phosphorus 2%. And of course, 
lower phosphorus is best. Because a lot of times, um, especially in Southern Delaware, we have high pea soils. So um, putting on the proper amount or the least amount of pea as possible uh, is, a, is a good practice. And so analysis sheets, th this tells you, um, this is a, 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 so a, a soil tested lab analysis and any reputable company that, that you uh, buy compost from will have one of these. And if they don't, then you might wanna consider to take your, your, your business elsewhere. Okay, so site preparation. Um, of course, that first starts with soil testing to determine um, nutrient status of the soil. And then uh, based on the recommendations from the, from the soil lab, you adjust accordingly. But we wanna move rocks, construction materials, um, and whatever other um, human debris that we might have in there uh, or um, plant debris, th those need to be removed as well. And then ideally six inches of, of, of topsoil uh, is, is a good start. Um, and then rough grade um, for proper surface drainage. And then once this site is rough graded, then we can start to talk about compost incorporation. And the way you prep a site uh, for turf grass is going to be the same for sod or for seed. Um, and so a lot of times people don't see it that way, but this is, this is the reality. And so what, what about for established turf? Well, if we already have an established turf lawn or, or whatever the case may be, um, there's a few, a few options available. Um, we can top dress with um, rolling spreaders and or if we have a large area, um, we, we, we can use these mechanical uh, gas powered uh, top dressers especially on, on, on really large properties. And then of course, there's the old shovel and wheelbarrow um, elbow grease method um, for, for really small areas. But one thing to consider, if you are going to uh, apply compost as a top dressing on, on an established turf grass surface, um, the, the best thing to do is airify the turf prior um, and then incorporate the, the compost or spread the compost because those holes allow the compost to work down into the soil, get that soil contact, and then the microbes can take it from there. And then some, some advantages um, to top dressing is um, surface smoothness. That's a big one. So if you have a really bumpy turf, um, uh, a, comp, uh, a compost top dressing will really uh, help you alleviate some of those some of those bumps and low areas. And then, if you're considering doing some seeding, uh, it's a great time to incorporate seed as well. And so, it helps dilute the organic matter, or excuse me, the thatch. And um, you're also introducing more organic materials to the soil. Okay, so how much? Well. This is a, a, a great chart to kind of make your decisions by. Well, if we're talking about a surface application to an established turf, we wanna be from a quarter inch to a half inch. Um, and anything that's being uh, applied to a, an establishment situation that needs to be tilled into the soil. So using this to determine how much um, compost you will need for, uh, for your area. So for example, if we look at the, the first line, it's a, a thousand square feet, we're gonna need about one cubic yard, um, which is one cubic yard is if you go to your local mulch dealer and you see that, that bucket that they use to dump mulch into the back of trucks, that's typically one cubic yard. Um, and then you can see as we work our way down, uh, for 40,000 square feet, which is just shy of an acre, um, you're gonna need 31 of those buckets to, to uh, top dress for um, uh, a quarter inch. But if we're talking about tilling it into the soil, that, that's a different story. But you can use this chart to determine how much compost you're gonna need and, and the depths of compost. Okay, so 
how long does this compost last and, and when, how often do I do it? Well, um, studies have shown that, that you can re reap these benefits for, for five years or even more. Um, so at a stab, if you're doing an establishment um, of turf, this would be, you would apply the compost, incorporate the compost into the soil at establishment, and then you might not need any for some time, five years or more, maybe. Um, but the, the decomposition depends on the carbon and nitrogen ratio of the compost as well. And then, you know, the, the temperatures and, and soil moisture. Um, if you're constantly irrigating or we have a really wet season, that decomposition rate was going to be sped up. Um, but yearly applications is probably not a best management practice. And here's one thing I wanted to, wanted to show you is this gentleman here uh, installed zoysia into his lawn. And this was two th early 2020, I believe. And he, he, in order to save some money, um, because zoysia side can be expensive, he decided to uh, leave gaps in between each piece of sod. And he asked, well, how can I get this to grow in as fast as possible? I said, well, top dress in, in, in the rows with compost. And so this was like, uh, I think maybe May of, of 20. Um, and on the right was three months later, I think at the end of the summer. So you can see how fast that moved. And so he was kind of dealing with the poor, poor soil as well. And so that addition of compost in those, in those gaps really helped fill in um, his, his zoysia side for that summer. And it looks absolutely fantastic. Okay, so let's talk about water management. Um, so looking at irrigation should be viewed through the lens of we're only trying to irrigate, to alleviate drought stress. Watering just to water is, is, is a poor idea. Um, and in situations um, where you do have an irrigation system, deep and infrequent is the number one BMP. And so if we look at our, our root structures here of different watering regimes, um, on the left, we have deep and infrequent. So we have a deep uh, fibrous extensive root structure from that method. And then if we have a deep and infrequent or a deep and frequent uh, regime, we have a very weak, um, uh, small root mass. Um, and of course, we all know that the more roots you have, the, the, the more hardier the plant. And then if we talk about um, a shallow and frequent, which is watering for just a little bit every day or every couple of days, um, all of the plants are, or all the, the roots are um, gathered there at the, the, the top couple inches of soil. And you have very few deep root penetrations. And um, these, these deep and frequent applications, the middle application it will cause anaerobic soils, which you're pushing all of the oxygen out of the soil and um, the water is taking its place. And when you have these situations where you have a constant uh, soil, mo soil moisture and leaf moisture, you're just opening the door for fungal pathogens and, and various other insect pests. Uh, and then that's why we see root dieback in a, in a very weak and thin root system. And then if we talk about the, the far right, the shallow and frequent, um, roots are lazy. They are very, very lazy. If they don't have to move and search for water, they will not do it. And so if you're always su supplying that water to the top inch or so of the soil, that's where they're gonna stay. And so that leaves the turf very easily drought stress or easily prone to drought stress. And then again, if we have a, a compacted soil, um, rooting depth can be an issue due to compaction. So. Um, that goes back to alleviate, alleviating that compaction with soil amendments prior to establishment. And so here's a, a cool picture. So the, the deep and infrequent allows uh, wetting of the profile and then drying down of the soil. And on the left there in picture A, you can see a soil root with few 
of those uh, microscopic root hairs. So the, the main structure is a root, and then you can see the fine hairs um, coming off of the, the main root. And then B, this is after, I think, uh, 28 days of dry down. Granted, this might be a, a really good soil where you can go 28 days, but the, the, the take home message is wetting the soil deeply and then letting it dry down induces this physiological response from the turf to produce these really fine root hairs. And root hairs can extract um, the, the tightly held water molecules from the soil colloids in, in times of drought. And so the plant ends up being more equipped to handle drought stress as we, as we move through the summer. And so, well, when do we water? Well, we have to, again, we have to play an active role in managing our turf. So uh, we have to look for signs of drought stress. So um, footprinting is one, um, graying or bluing, graying or blue, bluing of leaf tissue is, is another one. And, um, as the uh, cell walls start to uh, shrink from lack of water, you also see some um, leaf and, and leaf folding and rolling. And at that point, that's when you would really want to put the water on. Or um, um, if, you, if we're going to get a rain very soon, then maybe you can hold off. Uh, but that, that's, a, um, that's gonna be a site specific feel thing um, because it, it's not all, it, it's a bit of an art and a bit of a science, and every site is going to be different. So knowing your site and, and how, how far you can kind of push it um, is going to be something you have to determine over time with your site. And so this is an average weekly water loss chart for, for Delaware. And in the, the heart of the, the, the summer period, when we're really hot, um, we're looking at approximately an inch and a half per week. And um, so what we're aiming to do is try to replace that as much as possible with our irrigation system. Um, and again, if, if we don't receive the rain, that's where the irrigation system comes in. But thinking about when do we, when do we start our irrigation? Well, uh, mid to late May, um, Unless you're establishing turf in March or April, there, there's no need to even turn it on uh, because we just we just won't need it. And then once we we hit October, uh, that that's when you can can turn it off as well. So how do we get more precise with our irrigation um, and water management practices? Well, we can use smart controllers. Smart controllers, you now they're so good that you can have an app and and manage your, your irrigation system from anywhere in the world, wherever you have an internet access. So um, if you're on vacation and you know um, that you had scheduled uh, an irrigation application and you see um, the weather report that we're gonna get a bunch of rain, you can switch that off through the app. So that helps you, uh, gives you more control um, to be more precise with that water. And then another, Another one is, is soil moisture sensing. Um, this puts the, um, hand, the watering in the hands of a computer. So these, these sensors go into the ground, you calibrate them to tell to, and tell it when to come on once the soil moisture reaches a certain percentage. And then once that, that soil is dried down to the percentage that you establish, uh, then it kicks on the irrigation for the, the amount of time needed to replenish that uh, that, that water loss. And then irrigating, or excuse me, uh, auditing our irrigation system, knowing exactly how much is coming out. And we can do that with uh, a catch can test. Um, it, it does it take some time, but knowing how much water you're putting out. So if, if we've lost, a, a, for example, if we've lost an inch and a half of water in the middle of July, how long do you need to run your irrigation in order to replenish that inch and a half? If I ask you right now, so if it, how much irrigation or how much water are you, how many inches of water are you putting out if you run your irrigation for 20 minutes? Um, if you can't answer that, you probably need to be able to. And a lot of times your irrigation contractors may know this information ahead of time, 
but you can always do the catch can test in order to uh, figure out exactly how much irrigation you're putting out. Um, controller adjustments. Um, if you set your irrigation for some schedule when you turn it on in the spring and you leave it like that the, the, the whole year, that is a poor management practice and we need to be avoiding that. Um, again, irrigation should be used to supplement what we don't get in rain. And so we don't want to set our irrigation controllers when we turn it on in, in May or June uh, and then forget it for the rest of the year. This should be an active process that you are involved in the whole year. And again, going back to being a, a, a weatherman or weather woman. And if we're talking about daily timing, we want to do that just before sunrise. And so why do we do that just before sunrise? Well, during the night, we have uh, dew uh, and glutation uh, collecting on the leaves. And if we do it just before sunrise, it'll knock that off and lower our uh, uh, lower the time that moisture is on the leaf. And so the longer the leaf stays moist, the more uh, the, the higher probability we have for, for pathogens. So getting that leaf as dry as possible, um, watering before sunrise will, will help you uh, take care of that a little quicker. Okay, so here's the that's the end of, of that part of the, the talk. In the next, I don't know, three or four slides, uh, I'll talk about fall armyworms. So uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in, in this, on this chat, or excuse me, on this uh, talk have, have experienced this, but just know that you are not alone. This is a, a, a once in a generational type outbreak um, coming from Kentucky. Uh, I, I have seen them there in Kentucky back when I was a, a golf course superintendent there, but they were never at these, these population numbers. And, and so what kind of happened was, is we had some crazy rain events and, you know, it's a little scary to think about that these crazy weather events are starting to be more uh, regular, right? And these crazy events are the ones that are bringing these, um, these pests from the South or Southwest. Uh, where their native home range is. And so some of these malls of the fall armyworm malls can be, can travel up to 500 miles with these, with these cra crazy weather events, such as uh, remnants of hurricanes. And so um, we, we don't know how it's going to be going forward just because of the fact that these, these unusual or unnormal weather events are starting to become more normal. So um, th this is new for a lot of people, entomologists and anybody in the turf and ornamental business, this is all kind of new. Um, so we're just kind of doing the best we can and, and know that you're not alone uh, if you lost a lot of grass this year. But the one good thing is they do not overwinter here. Um, and so what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a frost in a couple of weeks and then that's the end of the, uh, uh, that's the end of the road for fall armyworms then. Um, either they're gonna die or they'll, they'll return uh, to a more Southern location to, to go through their, their life cycle there. But um, we, we didn't know um, what the possibility was for, for multiple generations. That, that was the big question. But uh, I have seen two so far um, here in Delaware um, because Fall army worms in the south, like Florida, uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, they can go up to four or five generations per year because the weather's warmer and they can go through that life cycle. And they have a longer season of growth. Uh, but the females can lay a thousand plus eggs and the 100% tall fescue stands got hit the hardest. And if, if that's not a sign, I don't know what is. Uh, we need to get away from these monocultures of, of, of grass. So. Um, I think I talk about it in my next slide. If not, I'll kind of go into that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, I do, I do that at the end, okay. Um, so let's talk about the life cycle. So we have an adult moth and this was earlier in the spring and those are the moths that got carried north with, that, with the, all those hurricanes, remnant hurricanes that we saw earlier this year. They lay an egg mass, which one of these um, adult moths can lay thousand plus. 
then we have the larvae uh, hatch from these egg masses. And once they hatch, they are very hungry. And so tall fescue and turf and, and corn and many other uh, plants are, are um, uh, it's like a buffet, especially if you have tall fescue. So they, they hatch from the eggs and then the, the closest thing they found was a lot of tall fescue. And then, so they do that and then they pupate in the soil. On the bottom right here, we have an egg mass where a lot of them are starting to hatch and then they'll make their way towards the, the nearest food source. And then top right is, here's the pupa and here's an active caterpillar. Okay, so let's talk about integrated pest management for crawl armyworm. So when we get to um, midsummer, uh, we're gonna have to start to scout for egg masses and, and look for caterpillars. And in order to determine if we have uh, our, our populations high enough or uh, that warrant a spray, um, let's do a soapy water test. And so I think it's about a tablespoon or a teaspoon of soap per gallon of water and um, mark off a one square foot area, empty that gallon into that one square foot area and sit there and wait. And if you find more than, than three of those caterpillars in that one square foot area, then uh, you need to react quickly because they can, they can take out a stand of turf overnight, um, more or less. So just getting ahead of it and starting to pay attention to, um, to, to your turf and, and see what's happening, um, that will give you the upper hand and, and give you some solutions to act quickly. Um, but again, pyrethroids have worked really well and they provide a very quick knockdown, but you have to um, make that application as soon as you, as you, as you, as soon as you determine that, that the threshold has been breached. Um, preventative insecticides like a celeprin, which is chlorin, chlorine um, that is the, uh, the, the best method. Um, but just because we had this, this outbreak, um, which is a, a generational type outbreak, that doesn't need, mean that we need to go spraying insecticides willy-nilly to, to protect against every single thing because we could go another 15 or 20 years and never see these again. We just don't know. Um, but spraying insecticides just to spray insecticides is not a good idea. So the take home message here for fall armyworm management is multi-species turf stand. So um, if, if, if you're doing 100% tall fescue, uh, I, I don't think that's a good idea not just for fall armyworms, but for other pests as well. Having a, uh, a multi-species, so what I, what I typically recommend, excuse me, is a 90% tall fescue mix with about a 10% Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, um, so, because a lot of times the bluegrasses were, were mostly left untouched. They, the, the fall armyworms went right around it and attack the, the tall fescue and the Bermuda grass. And uh, I'm not really sure of zoysia damage. I haven't heard too much. Um, so I, I do know that um, a lot of pests don't like zoysia um, other than maybe some grubs. Um, but um, yeah, so just think about breaking up your monoculture. Monocultures um, are, are just susceptible to so many issues and um, adding a little bit of, of, of Kentucky bluegrass and maybe even uh, a 5% Kentucky bluegrass with a 5% fine fescue. Um, maybe that's an, an option for you, especially maybe if you have um, uh, shade issues. So um, breaking up our stands is the take home message. And I, I think that's about it for me. Okay, so we're gonna go into the questions right now and, and I've taken the list. Um, you guys have been submitting questions throughout. What I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to stick to the questions that are concerning more fertilization, uh, water management, and the army worms. Anything about weeds and, and seed selection, if you guys can, maybe we can figure out a way to reach out to John a little bit later for that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start going down that list now. And if um, if there's some, some information, background information that I may need for your question, 
feel free to unmute yourself and, and let us know what uh, any information I might need. Absolutely. Okay, so the first question is, if your soil test shows low potassium, when and how do you increase that low level? Um, potassium fertilizer. And is there a certain time of year that, that they should be putting that on? Um, potassium, any time during the growing season is, is a fine time to put potassium on. So basically from May to uh, September is, is a good window. All right, uh, let's see. Is there any guidelines for dethatching and aerating? Um, as far as um, what, like how many times or how, I yeah, guess whoever asked that question, confusing. are you able to, to elaborate on that real quick for dethatching and aerating? Well, if, I'll just go ahead and try to answer. Um, if we're talking about cool season grasses, um, once a year is good. Uh, doing it in the spring is best. Um, and you always want to apply a, a little bit of fertilizer just before you aerate. And you wanna make sure that the grass is growing. So aerating in March, that's probably not a good idea. You wanna make sure that the grass is, is, is growing. And, that if you do it in late April, or early May, that's a, that's a good time to do it. But uh, you might want to follow or uh, prior to doing that, um, um, apply a little bit of, of nitrogen, maybe a quarter pound to a half pound of nitrogen just before you aerate. So you can have that grass grow and fill in those holes a lot quicker. All right, does thing the grass clippings, does that kill weed seed during the composting process? Yes, if you, it, well, I, there, there's a caveat. You have to make sure that the internal temperature of the pile reaches, um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a, a actual composting process um, um, savant, but I think it's a hundred and, uh, it's over a hundred degrees. So. If you, uh, if you have like a small at-home compost pile, um, it's probably not going to get over 100 degrees in the, in the center. So it's probably not going to work. You have to have a pretty big pile uh, of material there to get that, that core of the, uh, of the pile to 100 plus degrees. Awesome. Okay, let's see. Should you still use deep, infrequent, um, I guess it's irrigation for new turf sod versus after a couple of years for the same sod? The So I guess establishment of sod, do you, are you still gonna be using deep, infrequent watering? When you're established, at the first couple of weeks of establishment, that is gonna be the only caveat, right? Because you, you don't want the sod to dry out and you don't want the seed to dry out. And so all you're trying to do is keep that, that, that sod moist and then maybe the top layer of the soil moist so you can encourage those roots from the sod to penetrate into the soil and then get established. And the same for seed. You don't want it to dry out during that establishment period. But once you have the seed established and you're starting to mow it, or the, the seed or the sod, once you have it established and you're starting to mow it, then you can kind of flip gears and go to the deep and infrequent. Excellent, thank you. All right, let's see. Okay, so how long is running, or <laughs> sorry, I guess he didn't like the question. So anyway, <laughs> running an irrigation system considered deep watering? Uh, again, it depends on, on the weather. And you, you have to know uh, what kind of system you have and what your output is. So uh, it goes back to, let, let's say we haven't had a rain for seven days and we're in the first week of August, okay? Or the last week of July. So we're gonna average, we're gonna need about an inch and a half of water. You need to know how long you need to run your irrigation system uh, in order to achieve an inch and a half of water, right? So that, can either be done 
uh, by the catch can test, or maybe whoever installed it uh, can can get you pointed in that direction. But uh, you, you have to know your your output of, of your irrigation system. So if you run it for 10 minutes, right, let's say it's putting out a quarter inch of a water. So you're going to have to run that for six cycles. So 60 minutes in order to get an inch and a half, right? Um, so that's, that's why it's so critical to know what the output of your irrigation system is because minutes is irrelevant. You, you, you could, if you have the right sprinklers, you can run it for 10 minutes and put it, put it, put an inch and a half of water. Out. It, it all depends on what, uh, what your output is. So you have to know that first. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is, are there any tips or rules of thumb for managing turf over septic fields? How might that management be different than the rest of a lawn? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I, from my experiences with septic systems in the past is that, uh, the areas in the in the drain field typically need less fertilizer. Um, so if you are, the only way to determine that is to to hold back a fertilizer application uh, from and compare that with the surrounding turf around that. That, that that's a tough question to ask, but um, because I don't know how exactly how well or how poorly that drain field uh, actually drains. All right. Okay, so the next question is, as I guess they have, this, this individual has a rainbird system and it has a seasonal adjustment option. Is that sufficient to rely on the seasonal adjustment? Mm, I don't, the, it depends if the if the seasonal adjustment is calibrated properly and you have a rain uh, sensor or a soil moisture sensor, then it would make sense. The idea here is that um, if we're going to take the watering out of our hands, the only way to know um, how much rain we have is either to A, have a rain sensor or soil moisture sensors. Um, so we, we really have to be a little more active in the control of our, of our irrigation systems. Okay, uh, this is Dan Vance, uh, the yeah. one that asked it. Um, I, I do have a sensor that uh, senses it up above. It just senses whether or not we have, that it's raining and it'll stop, you know, irrigating. Uh, uh -huh. I don't actually have a uh, soil sensor uh, installed. Um, okay, so d does the um, rain sensor determine how much how much it rained, the volume, or does it just determine if it's raining or not? I, I think it's based on the area. In other words, like this particular area and the time of season that it just, you know, uh, like a hotter times that it that it applies, you know, that you have more irrigation, and then uh, as it gets cooler, then it does less. Well, that's another thing too to think about is like, what is it adjusting to? If do you have it adjusted? What are the baselines for that adjustment? So is that adjustment for an inch, a half inch? Um, if you don't know that, then that might be something to to look into to determine how much um, how much water do you actually need. Okay. All right, next is uh, on to some armyworm questions. The next one is going back 30 plus years in the business, armyworms and cutworms were associated with high nutrient regimens. I'm going to suggest that infestations were associated to lawns that had aggressive nutrient nitrogen programs. Do you agree? Um, uh, y yes. Um, so anytime the, the, the more inputs you have to a system, the more, um, the more pest problems you'll have to deal with. So I think that's a pretty fair assessment. The, the, the lawns and the turfs 
that I saw over uh, the past couple month or so, the ones that do absolutely nothing, they were never touched. It's the, the high input lawns that, that ended up getting dinged up the most. All right, um, for the soap test, how important mm -hmm. is the soap to water ratio for this test? A teaspoon per gallon. And and how important is that? If you if you mess with that, is that going to the is that going to mess up your your test result, or is that not like so? If you don't put enough, is that not going to bring the army worms up, or if you put too much, is that going to I don't know kill them? Well, putting in enough is if you put in too much, then it gets so soapy and foamy that you can't really see. So uh, a teaspoon to a tablespoon is, is going to be sufficient. But if you put just one little drop. Um, that might not be enough to, to stimulate uh, those, those uh, caterpillars to come up. Okay, um, one more fertilizer question we have here is if you need to apply lime, if you need to apply lime often, how, how often should you apply it? Most lime bags do not have recommended application rates. How do you deal with that? Um, you should apply a lime based on your soil test. So when you get a soil test from UD, they'll tell you how many pounds of uh, calcium carbonate per thousand square feet. And if you just kind of follow those rules, uh, you can, if you need a lot of uh, calcium carbonate per thousand, where you have to put, I don't know, 250 pounds per thousand square feet, uh, you can break that up, up into multiple applications. Uh, it's just kind of however you want to do it. Um, but all fertilizer or all lime applications um, should be uh, recommended off the soil test. Excellent. Thank you. So we do have a, a little bit more time. So, John, would you mind if I ask some of these other questions concerning pests and weeds? Uh, no, have, have at it. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do my best to answer anything. All right. So we have uh, the first question outside of that is what about grubs? How, how do you know if you have them and is it a common issue in Delaware? Uh, yeah, grubs is a common issue in all, in all um, urban landscapes, turf grass and ornamentals. Um, but as far as turf goes, you can always um, if you start to see some, some thinning of turf and some, some dying back, uh, what you want to do is you want to go and, and grab the, the turf. And if you can pull it up easily, um, you probably have a, a grub infestation. And if you pull back on that, that loose um, uh, turf, then you can usually, because those grubs are in the top uh, inch or two of the soil. And once you pull that back, you should be able to see a few of them. And, uh, if you do, uh, a lot of times the pyrethroids work really well. Um, something like a tall star or uh, a mitochloprid works really well for grubs. But one thing to, to, I wanted to um, address while we're talking about that is uh, a lot of a few of these lawn care companies were like, well, they, they, they were sending me a message saying, well, I applied a mitochloprid. Well, a mitochloprid doesn't work on fall arm bars. It only works on white grubs. All right. Let's see. Next, we have what is the best way to prevent and or control nimble will? Um, glyphosate. Tenacity will only ding it or knock it back. Uh, but unfortunately, there's no uh, quality selective herbicidal control for, for nimble will. So um, glyphosate application and then follow, to, follow that up with uh, seed or sod. And the good thing about glyphosate is that you can, you can seed right into it the day after or sod once it's dried. Gotcha, and so I guess um, on the same similar topic about bald spots, so if you have to remediate an area that's, that has um, been affected by something like that, how do you, how do you remediate that? Um, well, you have to, disturb the soil um, in some shape or fashion, whether you uh, vertical, vertical uh, cutting uh, or slit seeding, or you can even um, till it, um, 
however you get there, you, you're going to have to disturb the soil in some form or fashion to get good seed to soil contact. Or sod to soil contact, excuse me, either one. Okay, so we have uh, another question about sandy soil and mm -hmm. what seed type is best in the spring? What, what seed type is best for a sandy soil? Yes. Um, in the spring, well, we're going to have to, if we're looking to do something in the spring, it's probably going to be our cool season grasses, which is tall fescue and bluegrass. And as I said, um, uh, straight 100% stands of tall fescue, or, or while they work fine, um, they can uh, bite you in the rear in a, in a situation like an outbreak of brown patch or uh, outbreak of fall armyworm. So breaking that, that, that stand up with a little bit of uh, Kentucky bluegrass in that seed mix is a, is a, is a good practice. So, so John, I guess in, in relation to that, can you just really talk real quickly about the label? seeds so people know what they're getting? Yeah, so on the label, uh, it'll tell you percentage of the species and cultivar, um, and it's typically broken down into cultivars. It'll say like rebel tall fescue 50%, uh, raptor tall fescue 40%, and then 10% uh, Kentucky bluegrass. Um, and then below that, it'll tell you about weed seeds. And one, one take home message with this is if there is any percentage of noxious weed seeds in a seed bag, don't buy it. Um, as, as far as I'm concerned at this point, the way that we're able to uh, harvest and, and, and uh, filter turf grass seed, there, there's zero tolerance for noxious weed seeds and turf grass. So if there's any on that label, do not buy it, buy something else. Reputable companies do not allow for any noxious weed seeds. Thank you. So what would, would be used for empty areas that are wet? Uh, also in full sun, but they're, they're a little bit wetter. Mm, is this a, a mowed area or a non-mowed area? Did it, did it have, have any context with that? Um, this is Dan Vance. Um, I have some area, it was actually an area that was, um, I think because there was a problem with the, um, uh, like the water was filled in in a particular area, Ocean View came in and they uh, pulled out, uh, they had to scrape out the area. Uh, and then um, they initially they did not put, put topsoil, but they have recently put, been, been put good topsoil and then they hydro seeded. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they use um, uh, the rye grass, I believe. Um, yeah, okay, so rye grass is um, for a, a homeowner situation, I think is a, is a poor option. Um, I would avoid rye grass like the plague. Um, if, if you want to have ryegrass, have a ryegrass lawn, that, that, that's fine and dandy, uh, but you need to plan on um, fungal ap fun fungicide applications every month and maybe even every two weeks once we get into the summer uh, because ryegrass is highly, uh, gray leaf spot susceptible. Um, it's, it's, just not a, it's, not, it's just not a good option. Um, uh, typically places where ryegrass should be used is athletic field overseedings and golf courses and that's about it maybe maybe some um uh, like a, a park lawn or something like that where the only thing they're really doing is mowing um that might be okay uh, in, in a, uh, a non-monoculture situation but uh, for the for the homeowner average homeowner it's tall fescue bluegrass and zoysia i mean th those are your, your your three options basically I, I, at least in my opinion as far as ease of maintenance and quality and turf grass quality over the long haul, uh, that's uh, uh, that, that's my opinion. Okay, unfortunately, we didn't have much choice. It was Ocean View that put it down. Um, the county did, I, yeah, I believe. Well, but so I was trying to overseed on top of it. Uh, 
you know, to get better grass in there. Yeah, I mean, again, like a 90% tall fescue with a 10% bluegrass is going to be your best bet there. And okay. if, if you're, if that's if you're planning on mowing it. If you don't mow it, then you can use uh, like a Kentucky 31 um, or a fine fescue or something of that nature. Um, but if you're, if you plan on mowing it, it's, it's tall fescue and bluegrass. Okay, we do plan on mowing it. Okay. All right, well, we've reached the end of, uh, of our time here. We want to thank John very much. And I also want to.